UN mechanism in the the, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. We're going to talk about that today uh, with Paul uh, Nahimas. Uh, did I get that right, Paul? Close enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who joins us from Turkey? And by the way, Turkey changed the spelling of its name or took an old spelling. It's now Turkey A, but it's pronounced Turkey. Uh, on May 22nd, and asked the United Nations to approve that name, and they did. So now Turkey is Turkey A. Um, what's interesting is the reason, and the reason is that they didn't want to be associated with the turkey bird. This turkey bird had taken on a meaning in the English language to mean something silly that fails. <laughs> oh, so we now have another name for turkey. And he joins us from Istanbul, which is one of my favorite places. Thank you for coming on the show, Paul. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, uh, you know, from the point of view of uh, your work as a lawyer investigator for um, uh, the project Expedite Justice and others, uh, I want to talk to you about um, the UN mechanism in the in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Democratic may be the wrong word, because it seems like there's a, there's another war every time you look. And I guess the question I put to you is, can you have a a democratic republic when you're constantly at war? Can you do that? You can have a democratic republic when you're anything but democratic. So I guess why not? Uh, it's uh, they can call themselves whatever they like. Are they democratic? Uh, nominally, uh, yes. Uh, they they try to be. Uh, I think for the most part, um, uh, the country is beset with problems, um, but it's. Uh, certainly in the previous election, it's, it's considered a, I think, a well, a very flawed democracy. Um, it's trying to be a democracy. It has, it has, it's not a liberal democracy in any, by any means, um, but they are, they're doing their best uh, with what they've got under the circumstances that they find themselves in. Uh, why, why can't they do better? You know, it's not only Congo, it's Rwanda, and it's all the countries around there, Sudan and so forth. We've covered a number of them, sub-Saharan Africa, East Africa. It just seems like they're always in violence, and uh, and if you know, if you, let me let me go for another truism. If you're in violence, it's hard to build an economy. Am I right? Well, yes. Uh, if there's no stability, um, there's uh, a reluctance on the part of those that might uh, build industries to invest. Yeah. Um, and and that's not just something that you find in, in the DRC, um, but but in in most underdeveloped countries are underdeveloped uh, for a reason. Um, yes, there are other factors, but if there's no certainty, if there's no uh, rule of law or, or no belief that there is rule of law, um, then investors are unwilling to put the big bucks in to, to build factories or steel mills or, or pineapple plantations or what have you, uh, because they could lose it very, very quickly and not have a return on their investment. And when they do invest, they need a very big return on their investment to compensate for the risk that they could lose everything. Mm. And they uh, do. They do lose everything. Well, it's true. A going concern in Congo is really worth a lot less in if you if you sell it up front uh, in terms of its profit, the, the amount of profit it generates over years. Mm. Uh, for instance, twenty years of profits might be the full value of of an investment in the United States, whereas in Congo, I think it would be considerably less uh, because you could lose it tomorrow. So you take the risk. You need to extract as much out of it as you can. What I don't understand is, is the violence and the, the genocide. I was mentioned before the show, my, my limited reading on this suggests that the, the problems in Congo uh, are connected with, the, uh, with Rwanda. And Rwanda had a genocide back 20 years ago, which um, you know, people are still talking about, and uh, which the United Nations was unable to do very much about. And uh, it's, it's almost like you know, it's, it's connected, it's infection. From one country to the other, and then you find that there's a a, um, a guerrilla group, uh, an opposition group in the east of of Congo called M23. That I think that's from March 23rd, um, and uh, they they're very active and they've been active for a long time. And the president of uh, Congo is trying to raise an army of young people, uh, somewhere between half a million and a million people, to go fight with them. And he's bringing troops in from other countries from. Sudan and Kenya and uh, I don't know where else to. Yeah, I have a map on the screen. Um, you know, uh, from yeah, from uh, Zambia, and Tan Tanzania, uh, and and so forth to try to help him do that. It sounds like he's really under threat 
of some kind of national, you know, conflagration. Am I right? Uh, to, to a point, yes. I mean, there's a United Nations uh, mission based in Congo for, for over 20 years now, um, which has largely, um, well, has been playing a role in, in combating M23 for the most part. Um, certainly, uh, they undertook some offensive operations in 2012, uh, late 2012, when M23 uh, got into the city of Goma. Um, in, in the east, uh, in the east of Congo, just uh, very close to the Rwandan border. Um, yeah, so it's it's, but it's not the only um, group um, that's behind uh, instability in that country. There, there are multiple other ones, especially in the east. Um, uh, the Allied Democratic Forces, which is largely considered to be a, a uh, Islamist offshoot uh, associated with Al Shabaab, um, although the links between those two, again, it's not it's not my field, um, uh, uh, not not exactly as solid as they might be uh, painted out to be. Um, but why, why uh, are you in Turkey and and not in Kinshasa? Time, oh, time zones. Uh, well, I, I've actually finished uh, the project that I was working on in Congo um, a week ago, uh, and I'm, I'm taking a bit of a break because it was, it was five years. So um, I need a bit of a breather before I go back there. Uh, but we've been working uh, remotely, or we were working remotely since COVID um, on, on the mechanism. Uh, and the time zone here is obviously better than the time zones uh, in Australia, which would require me to work at you know, ridiculous hours of the morning. So it was more consistent to, to be based here. Well, a couple of things we're going to try to connect in this show is one is a few years ago, I, I, I want to say 2017, two United Nations workers were killed, murdered in Congo. And, um, and, and so the discussion here today is about the mechanics of the UN in dealing with that and other atrocities and the like. I mean, it's hard to investigate or deal with atrocities in a given country if they're gonna murder your representative. Um, it, 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 it's, it's not encouraging to your representatives and it's not encouraging to the people who rely on, on uh, UN representatives. So it's a real problem. Right. So uh, why were they there? Why were they killed? So the, um, the uh, two, uh, experts, as they call them, um, Zayda Catalan uh, and Michael J. Shah, uh, Swedish and American respectively, uh, were working on uh, the group of experts for the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a, a group of independent uh, investigators that report to the Sanctions Committee of the Security Council in relation to sanctions that the Security Council enforce on individuals, countries, companies and the like. Uh, and the, uh, the purpose of that group of experts is to inspect uh, situation, various situations in Congo to find evidence of crimes against humanity uh, and, and, and atrocities uh, that they would submit in their reports to the Sanctions Committee in support of sanctions against certain, certain individuals and, 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 and the like. Uh, Kasai was a relatively calm uh, area of Congo, uh, central Congo, um, and uh, the city uh, in question is Kananga, well, it's the closest city to where the incident took place. I don't know if that shows on the map, but why don't we look at the map for a second, yeah. get a handle on that. So this would be right in the center of Congo. Yeah, it's in the center. You, you, it probably, it, it's generally marked. It's a city of between half a million and one million people, depending on who you ask. Mm -hmm. uh, with no electricity and no running water, uh, which is interesting to say the least. Um, and uh, this region uh, became somewhat unstable in 2016, um, primarily uh, due to or subsequent to the um, accession of a new chief, uh, the Kamwina Sapu, um, uh, and his name was uh, Pandi, uh, who, uh, who acceded to the throne as such. Uh, they call him a king, a prince, and, uh, and a chief, depending on who you ask and was not recognized by the central government and sought recognition. And uh, that dispute festered up until the point where uh, central authorities uh, deployed a task force to, let's say, deal with him and he was killed. Uh, as a result, his guard scattered and an uprising commenced where elements of the state, uh, police stations, military convoys and the like were being attacked 
in various parts of uh, central Kasai province and, and eastern Kasai, Kasai Occidental. Um, over the course of late 2016 and early 2017, there were some uh, atrocities committed, uh, allegedly on both sides. And the group of experts who were principally based in the east of Congo took an interest and wanted to get down to uh, determining where this conflict had originated, what was happening, and who was doing what. So allegations of, of mass graves, child soldier recruitments, uh, and, and massacres committed on the part of state elements, uh, the army and police, uh, as well as militia-related elements, uh, attracted their interest. And they deployed to uh, Kananga in very early 2017, in January, uh, to make introductions, inform local authorities that the group of experts were going to conduct an inquiry uh, in the region, and then returned in March, uh, in, in early March of 2017. Uh, and in the course of a mission to a regional town outside of Kananga, um, Kolbun Konde, uh, they were ambushed and killed. By whom? Okay, subsequent to the uh, killing, a video uh, emerged and it appeared to show that elements of the Kamwina Sapu militia uh, were responsible for the killing. Um, largely based on their, uh, their accessories being red bandanas and, uh, and a chief or what appeared to be a chief wearing red cloak uh, who were involved in the operation, as they call it. So that well, this, was the- this, this is of great concern to the United Nations when they're- it, Indeed. Um, yeah. They effectively report to the highest deliberative body on the planet. So uh, the, it, the, the killing of two UN uh, investigators who report to what is essentially a little sanctions committee of the Security Council, um, it is extremely significant. And the Congolese military authorities conducted an investigation because a couple of days prior to the killing, uh, an operational zone was declared um, because of the insurgency, which effectively put the crime under military jurisdiction uh, because in the context of an, of an insurgency. So an investigation was conducted on the basis of the video and on the basis of a star witness um, whose name was Jean Bosco Mukanda. Uh, and the investigation continued for uh, no more than two months prior to being handed over to the court. Now, what happens when an investigation? Well, is what court is that? Court? It's the military court uh, in, in of, Congo. Yeah. In in well, it's the military court of the province of uh, Kasai, ex, Kas, ex Eastern Kasai, which has been broken up into three provinces, but they still work as if the old province existed. It's it's a little bit complicated. Um, so it's a lower level military court, military tribunal at that point, which then became a court, to deal with the militia men responsible, allegedly responsible for the killing. Um, however, the international community, uh, as they like to call themselves, weren't satisfied by, uh, by the manner in which the investigation was conducted. There was a lot of scrutiny by some journalists who were based in Congo at the time, rightly so. Uh, and this put pressure on the UN uh, to create some form of um, a capacity development mission to, to provide technical advice, technical support, and monitor uh, the investigation and trial. But the complication was that uh, the investigation had already been handed over to the court, which means that the investigation can't continue anymore. They can't continue to investigate once the dossier has gone to the court. But what they hadn't done was, uh, and what I failed to mention, is that along with the two experts, were three uh, motorcycle riders and one interpreter who accompanied them, who have since vanished. Now, uh, the bodies of the two experts of Zayda and Michael were recovered uh, about uh, six weeks after, um, after the fact. No, actually, no, sorry, uh, several weeks after the fact. Um, and, uh, but the, but the, uh, the bodies of the um, uh, companions, traveling companions were never recovered. So a new dossier was opened in relation to the deaths of, alleged presumed deaths, disappearance of the four Congolese companions of the two experts, which allowed for the reopening of the investigation. So what, you know, what, what was the presumptive reason for killing them and, and why was that offensive to the local authorities and also to the UN? Originally, uh, in, in the initial investigation that the uh, Congolese military authorities conducted, 
Um, the allegation was that they were robbed uh, and killed and, and basically robbed. Um, the motive changed as the course of the investigation unfolded. Uh, and what's been presented to the court now is that there was a level of conspiracy um, whereby uh, elements of the militia conducted the killing uh, at the behest of certain other persons not necessarily based uh, in, in militia areas. Um, at the moment, the matter is still before the court. Um, the, the investigation is still underway. Uh, what I can say is that the initial investigation uh, that was conducted by the Congolese military authorities was stopped, the trial was stopped when the mechanism deployed at the end of 2017 to resume the investigation and find leads above those that were on the ground to commit the killing, which resulted in the arrest and charging of the star witness, whose name was Jean Bosco Makanda. I think I mentioned him before. He in uh, custody was, now? Oh, yeah, he's been sentenced to death um, oh, oh at the lower, lower court, but now it's before the Court of Appeal uh, as the orchestrator um, of, the, of, the, of the murders. Um, I, I have to be guarded in terms of what I say in relation to the investigation. As it, as I understand. It unfolds, that's, I where, understand. Yeah, that's where let's, it's at. Let's, let's go to the policy point about the United Nations. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of the United Nations. Uh, it's, it's kind of surfaced. Uh, it was not particularly effective in dealing with global COVID, I would say, and global vaccines and the like. I mean, there was a fair amount of criticism on that. Um, and then more recently, you know, the affair in uh, Ukraine um, with the International Criminal Court, which is, I know it's not a part of the United Nations, but it's, it's close. And, um, went, you know, I, I saw a uh, frontline um, just a couple of days ago, a frontline documentary on it. And they pointed out that the International Court uh, has not issued a single indictment against any Russian involved in Ukraine. And, you know, it's been nine months now, and you wonder, you know, what's missing. Um, so you wonder about the international court mechanics. And we're here to talk about the mechanisms, aren't we? Um, the, the United Nations has not had effective mechanisms at the Security Council to deal with atrocities and uh, aggressions on a large scale. Um, and now we're looking at a, 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 a multiple murder of United Nations people um, that is already almost what, five years old, six years you, old. And, you and up, what, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, you brought up a lot, uh, quite a, a number of issues <laughs> that really need to be addressed in, individually. Um, uh, so uh, the UN is the sum of its parts. And what we've got to be careful about when we criticize the UN, which a lot of people like to do, is not to make the, um, the good the enemy of the perfect. We're better off with the UN than without it. Despite its flaws, despite its bureaucracies, despite its uh, ineffectiveness in, in certain cases, uh, it, it, it does create a forum uh, for multiple players to be heard. Um, and that's at least something. Um, the presence of the UN and the DRC, I think, um, having, having worked there for the last five years, is a positive across the board. Uh, yes, individual uh, blue helmets have been responsible and in some cases convicted of crimes against, uh, against local people, horrible crimes. Um, but on the whole, uh, as far as it, uh, when you're talking about some 20,000 people who make up the mission, if not more, at various points in time, uh, I think it's been a net benefit for the, for the country. Um, there would have been a lot more suffering, a lot more death, a lot more starvation, a lot more killing uh, without the presence of MONUSCO at the moment, as it's called. Um, since uh, since the late 1990s, well, it's called Monusco now. It's been it's been through numerous uh, different rebrandings. Um, Tell me how that maybe, works. Tell me why the United Nations has been a, a positive force in Congo. Uh, in in terms of right, in terms what, whatever, of whatever, whatever the presence of the presence of the UN to some degree inhibits where they are to some degree. And and again, I'll be you know I could be attacked left, right, and centre for saying this. I believe it does inhibit uh, the sorts of crimes that it's there to prevent to some degree. Uh, I believe that there is a positive capacity development aspect to the presence of the UN mission 
for the most part, uh, having been part of a, a UN mechanism, which is not part of MONUSCO, it's not part of the UN mission in Congo, but it's there to uh, offer technical support, advice, and monitor the uh, conduct of an investigation by the Congolese military authority. There has been a large improvement in the manner in which certainly the those that we've advised conduct their investigations, even when we're not there. So the way that they apply some of the things that we've, we've passed on, just our practices from where we used to work, uh, has been largely beneficial in terms of um, carrying out uh, judicial investigations and, and prosecutions in Congo. It is not perfect by any means. And, and the trial of the, uh, those uh, responsible, well, charged with the killing of the, um, the two experts is flawed in many ways. Uh, Legally flawed? I mean, is it going to stick? Uh, there are certainly some problems. Uh, we've been, uh, well, we, I was in my previous life uh, part of trying to address them. Uh, there are different ways in which they conduct business, which we don't agree with. And we've worked to address some of those things and they have largely been addressed. Well, not largely, but to some extent, they've been addressed some of those things. Um, but uh, every institution is, is uh, stuck in their own way. Um, they have their own culture. They have their own way of doing things. And it's not just going to change to 180. And it's not so that our way of doing business is perfect either. Uh, is this a just problem with the rule of law? Is there oh, a totally. problem with the procedure in the court? What, what, totally. What's the problem? Totally. I, 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 could, I could bring it down to a few examples which are quite benign. Um, when the mechanism first arrived, uh, the way in which interviews of suspects and witnesses were conducted is all on paper. So it's question and answer. And it doesn't necessarily take the response of the witness or what the witness says. If the witness makes an open declaration, they have to constitute it as a question and answer. And sometimes the answer is 180 degrees different to what was actually said. So the first thing that we did was insist on video recording them. And, uh, and the response we got was, oh no, it's not in our law, so we can't do it. So well, <laughs> is it prohibited in your law? No, but it's not mentioned, so we can't do it. So well, <laughs> if it's not prohibited, then we can do it. And uh, it took a little while, but we convinced them that it would be a, a way to you know, be more accountable and more transparent. But it's been very difficult to convince the court to, uh, to accept uh, video recorded um, evidence as opposed to what they're used to. Everything has to be on paper. It's an aid uh, if there's a dispute. The idea was that if there's a dispute in relation to a witness, a witness or a suspect saying, oh, I never said that. Um, and the answer to a question is, you know, I was not there or I was there and I didn't do else, whatever, whatever is, is allegedly said and signed. And if they change their mind, they say, I never said that. Well, we can play the video. And that's actually been a little bit difficult. Um, but we got there in some cases. And I, I see that as an improvement. You have to accept the little victories. Um, other so you're working, of, you're working upstream on this, but it's, oh, been, totally. it's been five, five years. Uh, how, how far into the process um, are you? Is it done? Is it, uh, you, you mentioned- There's an appeal hearing at the moment. There's uh -huh. the investigation is still underway uh, in terms of other other persons who um, who uh, we believe were involved, um, but the appeal hearing is in relation to those that were convicted uh, earlier this year. Uh, some fifty people, uh, many of them are, are alleged members of the militia, and and really when you when you live in, in an area which has been overrun by militia, you, you either adhere to the militia or you die or you or you you lose whatever you might have. So being a member of a militia, in my mind, doesn't necessarily mean that you're responsible for the killing and doesn't necessarily mean that you should be con condemned to death. But what their processes did was sort of bundle the two together, which was uh, quite counterproductive. And I, I don't necessarily attribute that to, to anything uh, malign as such. I think it's just the way that they do business and mm. we're trying to get them to distinguish that. So what, what happens at the end of this uh, trial, so to speak? You mentioned that the one fellow was uh, condemned to death, but that was on appeal. Many, actually many. Uh, many have been uh, sentenced to death. The um, Democratic Republic of Congo has a moratorium on, the, um, on carrying out of the death penalty. Uh, and it's in there for almost 20 years. Uh, so effectively, those sentences will be commuted to life imprisonment anyway. Mm -hmm. The appeal in their system is different to our system. It's different to the United States and Australia and the British system. 
uh, in that you can introduce new evidence and um, and, and essentially uh, evidence that has been um, collected since the original trial uh, at first instance. After this appeal, there is room for another one, but only on the basis of law, only on errors in law. So oh, this, this moment, doesn't go to the United Nations then. This is all within no, the this is all domestic and, and system. That's correct. The, the reason why is because the UN negotiated with the Congolese to have some kind of input because it didn't, it's certainly in my mind, I don't think that they would have been able to set up an independent tribunal as such that would give jurisdiction to international investigators to go into Congo and do what they want. Um, we had to get, they had to get the Congolese on side. And I think that they did the best that they could with what they had. Uh, for the most part, to have that consensus, have the Congolese side agree, um, sign a memorandum, and then deploy the mechanism. To so Congo. there's no expression of power here by the United Nations. In other words, there's no boots on the ground. There's nobody... Uh, well, there are boots on the ground, uh, but that's a MONUSCO. It's a different body. So the, the, um, the UN mission in Congo is not the mechanism. They provide some support to the mechanism, but they're not the yeah. mechanism. The mechanism. It's mostly yeah. advice and consultation. Um, and an attempt to um, improve the improve the Congolese criminal justice system. I think you'd be surprised what happens behind the scenes. Um, but <laughs> on, on the surface, on the surface, yes, uh, on the surface, it's quite collegial. Um, we we try to come to uh, agreement on on certain points of um, of difference, and I I, I firmly believe uh, that it's been very successful. Uh, everything has its flaws, um, but I think at the end of this, when 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 the um, inquiry, the investigation is over, and the mandate of the mechanism comes to an end, um, I, I think there'll be a, a very long list of successes. Uh, there'll be some issues that would need to be addressed in case this is done again, and and I think that's I, I understand that that's being considered. Um, that this uh, well, that's this important. So that to the extent that you have. Uh, counseled with them and helped them, you know, improve their criminal justice system in, in these trials. Will those lessons carry forward? Will those lessons apply to other mm, trials for murder and atrocities and what have you uh, later on? Uh, or think, will it have to be reinventing the wheel later on? Well, you can only help you can only, uh, let's say, have an impact on, on, on those that you work with. And I, I believe that um, the, the personnel that we have worked with long term, uh, I think, have adapted uh, new techniques and, and taken to them like ducks to water. Um, how far that permeates into their military justice system. And again, it is the military justice system. There's a civil justice system as well, which deals with criminal trials. Um, but in this case, it's being dealt with by a military court, a military prosecution authority in a military court. Um, I, I believe that they are applying those in, in other cases. Uh, well, I know that they are because I've seen them doing it. I think that they've benefited largely. It's, it's certainly been expressed to us and, we, and we've seen the effects of what we've done. But it's a very small team. It's not a massive uh, support force as such to, to help the Congolese military justice in a country of what is almost 100 million people, and it's vast. Well, if uh, you brought a lot of people there, I think you might get some pushback anyway. If, but, if well, that, 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 is, that is true. Uh, that, that's largely true. This is a very pinpointed uh, mission for a specific purpose, and it's to ensure uh, accountability, integrity and accountability of investigation and trial. What's the difference the between this process and a truth commission? We've heard from you know Project Expedite Justice about truth commissions in various places in Africa and Latin America. And um, you know what's what's the difference here? Uh, in in this case, it's a standard investigation and prosecution of alleged perpetrators of a crime, uh, being the killing of two UN experts and allegedly the killing of, because we, we aren't, the bodies weren't recovered, of four Congolese. Uh, so it's not commission. a truth commission. Nobody, nobody confuses it with that. No, 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 no. This is not a truth commission. No, no, no. So let me ask you one other thing. You know, you've been, you've been running with this now for several years and you've followed every step of the way and you've seen it, you know, where it is faithful to the recommendations that the UN experts make, and maybe sometimes not, not quite so much. But um, query, 
if you were going to look at the mechanism that the United Nations has in place to deal with these murders, to deal with these trials, to deal with the political, the political environment around these trials, uh, how would you change it? How would you improve it? If you were uh, Guterres, you know, the uh, Secretary General, uh, whatever, of the United Nations, um, what would you want to change to make this more effective? Oh, is this a wish list? Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> there's many things that I would like to uh, have um, have different in, in the mandate and the like, but I have to be realistic and, and we, have to, we have to accept that uh, in an organisation uh, which essentially works to, to which seeks consensus, um, you have to have an agreement of all parties. You're not going to be able to impose uh, a, a special tribunal with investigators who have full jurisdiction to run around in Congo and do what they want uh, without um, a resolution from the Security Council, which would probably be vetoed by one or two powers that have other interests. Uh, and maybe not, but it just, it, you're not going to get there. The first thing you've got to try and do is get uh, parties to agree. And, and I think that under the circumstances, they did very effectively. In, with 2020 hindsight, yes, there are some things that might have been done better, but really at the time, and I, I was there at the time, um, I think we got what we could and, and it, was, it was good at the time. Then we realised what was missing after, but you're not going to go and revisit a mandate. It's not that easy. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big organisation. It's a very long process to try and get the UN uh, and, and, and the, the authorities of a state to come to an agreement to have a group of foreigners to come in and have access to, uh, to, to your prosecution authority in an area and a whole, whole investigation, which might be embarrassing. Um, again, they, in this sort of case at the beginning, uh, many of the authorities didn't necessarily know what we might find. Um, so it's, it's a case of, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, which I have a habit of doing, is that there are known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns. <laughs> um, and, and, I mean, you, you have to respect that, and that would, that would apply anywhere. It's not just that, oh, in this case, this particular country was... Okay, know, I, let me say that I wish, uh, and I suppose you do too, uh, that the United Nations had more authority, more effect, more influence on these things. You know, here we have sub-Saharan Africa, especially Eastern Africa, which is fragmented, which is violent, which is um, politically, um, politically uh, dynamic, that's the wrong word, splintered, okay? A, a continual change of politics from hour to hour. And uh, so what could the United Nations, in a more perfect world, uh, do to improve life for the citizen on the street? for his safety, for public health, for the development of businesses that, that have some sustainability, um, for, you know, for political stability. What could the United Nations do in sub-Saharan Africa to make a better world, theoretically? Whatever its member states allow it to do and agree for it to do, ultimately. It's very easy to bash the UN as some separate entity to some of its parts. No, but you, you mentioned a, a while ago that uh, some, some members of the United Nations might oppose taking affirmative action on these things because mm -hmm. it was not in their interest to do so. They might veto it. Uh, and so the question is, what interest would drive them to veto steps that would lead to greater stability in an area which is not stable? Um, do they want to see chaos? Hypothetically what? speaking, hypothetically yeah. speaking, they may have economic interests, and mm -hmm. it's not always the same players. It, it really, it really all depends if you if you follow um, if you follow the work of of the UN or the work of the Security Council over the past however, however many years. Uh, there's always differences in opinion uh, for valid reasons. Sometimes um, uh, differences in approach, differences in culture. Uh, China, for example, always. Uh, argues a non-interventionist approach, not to interfere with other states. They abstain. They've, they've always had this history of abstaining um, with, uh, in, on the Security Council. As you know, they carry a veto. Um, and, and other states have economic interests. So when a resolution is put forward, uh, they veto it, they vote against it uh, for whatever their interests might be. And those interests might be a, a, 
a payoff. Uh, there might be a, an agreement with other states that if they vote this way on this one, then another state will vote a different way on another one. It, it, it's an organisation that relies essentially on consensus. It's not, it's not this powerful body, everybody, well, everybody, so many people attack and say, oh, the UN isn't doing enough, or the UN's doing too much, they're going to impose a world government on us. The UN is a sum of its parts. And it's all and good for uh, individual state players to, to throw rocks at it. It can only be as good as those individual state players allow it to be. Mm. Uh, very interesting. I, so here you are, you're from uh, Sydney, a very stable city and a stable country of Australia, an admirable country in many, many ways. And um, um, you're involved, uh, in, among other places, uh, in Congo. Um, it must be somewhat frustrating for you um, to have to work on you know, the, the minimalist end of things uh, when it's clear that a more powerful United Nations could do more. And so my question to you here at, at the close well, it sounds sound like you disagree. The premise with of your, the premise of premise is... your question is a problem because a more powerful United Nations is essentially relying on greater input from the United States. Okay, okay, okay. I'll, I'll accept that. But but query, do you do you have a certain sense of frustration about this, and why do you do it? Oh, it can be very frustrating. Um, why do we do it? Uh, well, I still remember where I was when, um, when I first saw the news report about the two experts who had, were missing at the time. Um, I was working with the Department of Justice in New South Wales in, in, in Australia, and, um, and I, I never even for a minute thought that I'd be asked to, to work on this, uh, as happened some five, six months later. Um, because uh, it, it's, it's something that we're driven, and my colleagues would, would say the same thing. I know they're, they'd be in full agreement with me. Um, it could have been us. could have been me. I worked in Africa before that in a similar, in a similar capacity for a different organisation. It could just as easily have been me. It could just as easily have been any of my colleagues. Um, having looked at uh, what Zyder and Michael, in this case, had done, preparing for their mission, uh, we would have made the same decision. We would have done the same thing as them. Therefore, uh, we, can, we can identify with them uh, and, and we want to get to the bottom of it. We want to get to the bottom of what happened to them and why. Uh, and at the and end of the day, there's a motivation there to protect the United Nations, to protect its experts, its people, no? Well, well, you well what's, the, what's the point? If, if the United Nations can send experts in to conduct an investigation and they can be targeted and killed with no consequence, what's the point? Let's just pack up and go home. Yeah. We've got to go home now, Paul. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for this really, really important and interesting. Pleasure. Discussion. Thank you. Thank you for having Great me. Great to have you to on. discuss in too little time. Yeah. Uh, really appreciate it. And, and please, please, uh, thank you for your service. Aloha. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.